Thank you for being part of the Oakwood Free Will Baptist Church Ministries. Our prayer is that those who listen to the Word of God will find a greater revelation of God's purpose in their lives. For additional resources, please visit us on the web at www.oakwoodfwb.com. Today, may you be encouraged, strengthened, and refreshed by our message. It's a day that you've made, and we rejoice, we're glad in it, we thank you for uh, the time that we can be together this morning as your family, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, I pray that you would uh, help us as we continue this study in the book of uh, the book of John. Uh, Lord, that, uh, that you would help us to learn some things or be reminded of some things today uh, that would help us to be better than what we are in our relationship with Christ. And Lord, we pray for these requests. Uh, we pray for those that have been mentioned this morning that were injured with fireworks. Now, there were several mentioned this morning. We ask you would uh, continue to watch after and heal them. Lord, for um, the one who is yet to have surgery for Karina, we pray that you would guide the doctor's hands there. And uh, we pray for healing there. Lord, we ask that you would certainly be with Brother, Brother Ernie's uh, nephew. Uh, Lord, that you would uh, just give him grace and peace. And Lord, spiritually, that you would meet any need there. Uh, and as well as that you would comfort the family. And uh, Lord, we pray that uh, you would continue to be with Jimmy's mom, and, and Lord, we pray that um, uh, you would be with those that will be with us today during the service that do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And Lord, I pray that today would be that day that they would trust Him. And uh, Lord, we just commit ourselves to you afresh and anew, and Lord, we ask that you would uh, take us from where we are to where we need to be in our relationship with you this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, we're in the book of John, chapter 1. So, John chapter 1, um, come on in, make yourself at home. John chapter 1, and we're going to read verses uh, 1 through 5, and we're going to kind of go over just a little bit about what we talked about last week, uh, but, um, uh, and then we'll try to, try to finish out the lesson. I, I did not get anywhere near uh, where I wanted to be uh, last week, but maybe we can finish it today. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. I know that there are a lot of things that have gone on uh, in our country and, and, you know, a lot of different things that have happened that as a Christian, um, we, we don't really like the turnout of things. And so the truth of the matter is, folks, from the time that Christ came into this world, even through now, men have always loved darkness rather than light. And, and it's because... Well, even it, when you when you go all the way back to the Old Testament, and when you know uh, the Bible talked about that the wickedness of man was so great that God decided He's going to destroy the whole world with a flood, and He did, and He started all over again. And guess what happened? Man messed it up again, and it just has continued to be a cycle uh, of this all throughout history. And the truth is, Jesus came into the world to be that light to shine in a dark world. You know, when you go to another country, I have been told, I've not been to other countries before, but I have missionary friends that have been to other countries such as Africa and India, and literally when you, when you leave these great United States, and, and as bad as our country is, I believe it's still the greatest country in the world. And, and I am proud to be an American, I am proud to be here, but when you go to another country, you can literally feel the darkness when you go into those places. And these missionaries say, you don't understand. You think it's dark in America. You go to these other countries where there is paganism and, you know, they worship idols and they worship, in many cases, Satan. Some of them do. And he said, you would not believe the darkness that you literally feel when you go into that country, into those places. And so Jesus came to give light to everyone, to all of us. And we need to pray for our brothers and sisters who are around the world who are being persecuted for their faith. Um, and so pray for them. Pray that the light, 
even through the persecution, that Christ's light will shine forward in their lives. Um, you know, when you look at verse 1, we talked about the fact last week that John lived in a Greek city and culture in Ephesus, but he grew up in a Jewish background and, uh, and culture in the areas of Galilee and Judea. As he sought to tell the story of Jesus in Ephesus, he was faced with a problem of how best to talk about the Lord in a meaningful way because he's talking to Jews and Gentiles. Not just the Jewish, not just the Gentile people, but he's talking to both of them. And so when he began... Uh, the gospel here in the book of John with the familiar words that were, I'm sorry, that were familiar words to all the Jews in the beginning, referring back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God. So he's associating with the Jewish people, but he's also associating with the Greeks when he says, in the beginning was the word. That is coming from the Greek word logos, which was very common for the Greek people to use. So he's trying to identify with both sets of people. And by the way, the Apostle Paul, if you remember what he said in the New Testament, he said, I become all things to all men that I might win some. So Paul is trying to identify himself with both sets of people so that he's got something in common with both of them so that they will oh, spark an interest and they'll want to hear what he's got to say. And you know, I think sometimes... We are so caught up in one way of, of doing things that sometimes we're not a draw to people. And, and I'm going I'm to specify when I say this. I try to know a little bit about everything. Okay? Um, I, know th- I know some about sports. I don't know a whole lot about it, but I know some about sports enough to be able to carry on a conversation with people that may be interested in sports. I know enough about music that I can carry on a conversation. In other words, I know a lot of different things, not a whole lot about a lot of different things, but a little bit, enough to identify myself with certain people uh, so that I can try to help them in their relationship with God. And, And I'll tell you this, people will not want to know what you gotta say until they first of all know that you care about them, okay? And so that's what I mean, become all things to all people that we might win some. The Bible tells us that we're to be the light. Jesus was the light of the world. We are to be the light of the world as we follow Christ. And the Bible says that we're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, but it's going to shine its light to everything around. So so we are to be uh, identifying ourselves with all these folks so that we can try to win them and bring them into a relationship with God. God. John, he further talked about uh, that the Word was with God, and this is referring to his eternality. That is, he's always been and always will be. When you look in the book of Genesis chapter 1, we talked about last week in verse 26, where God said, let us make man in our image, referring to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And folks, we are made in the image of God. But when you look in the book of Romans chapter 1, we talked about in prayer breakfast, it talks about the fact that man has changed uh, the image of the incorruptible God into an image made like into corruptible man. And has worshipped four-footed beasts and, and beasts and four-footed things and all that. In other words, we're we have become gods ourselves in our world today. Rather than worshiping the one true God, we have perverted that and think, oh, we can make our own rules and we can go our own way. And the truth is, we can. But God one day is going to give us up if we keep on in our ways. He's going to say, fine, you want to go your way, have at it. When you read the book of Romans chapter one, it talks about that. And so, but we are to try to help people to see that they need a relationship with God and it only comes through Jesus Christ, okay? And so, uh, and there's a right way and a wrong way to do that. We speak the truth in love, okay? Verse 2, it says, he was in the beginning with God. And again, God God is referring to Jesus as the Word. That is, uh, he is God. Uh, And... um, The phrase with God emphasizes a distinction between the Word, that is Jesus, God's Son, and God the Father. John talked about in in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, uh, he stated this truth because the vast majority of the gospel focuses on Jesus and his distinct role as the one being sent by the Father, pointing the way to the Father. And so therefore, from the earliest years of of the Christian movement, the inspired writers of scriptures affirmed the Trinity. That is, one God existing in three eternal persons. We can find that in chapter 15, verse 26. But then when you look in verse 3, 
having established that Jesus was God and was with the Father in eternity past, John turns his attention to creation. Jesus was the agent, God's agent, as he created the light, the firmament, the seas, the dry land, the animals, the people. Uh, the phrase, all things, talks about the fact that the full scope of creation came into existence by or through Jesus. And so to reinforce this truth, John talked a little bit later about the fact that from the opposite perspective, not one thing was created apart from Jesus. And we read that in those verses. Having brought everything into being, every living thing, every inanimate part of creation depends on Jesus for its existence. So not only did Jesus create everything, because he is God, but he also holds everything in its place. The very breath that we breathe, the very life that we have, the very molecules of our body and of our being are held in its place because of Christ. And it, it is unfathomable to me to think about that. The fact that, you know, all Jesus would have to do is think, think the thought or whatever, and everything would just fall apart. All the gravity and things that hold our world into place, that is Jesus that's holding it into place. And so, by Him all things consist, the Bible says. If people are fully dependent upon Jesus for their physical lives, are they not also dependent upon Him for their spiritual lives? If so, here's a question. What implications does this truth have for growth in the Christian life? We are totally, here's the answer, we are totally dependent upon Him. We want to think we've got everything under control. We want to think that we're all, it's all about us. But the truth of the matter is, we're nothing without Christ. We are nothing. We could never be anything without Christ. And sometimes that hits a kind of a raw note with people who, you know, who think, man, I am a God. I am my own thing. And so it's important for us to recognize that we are dependent upon God. Verse 4, John talked about an all-important term, and here's the word. The word is life. For the first time in the gospel, he mentions this. And this is, it comes from the Greek word zoe, uh, which is pronounced, well, it's pronounced zoe. It's, it's pronounced, spelt like Z-O-H-E-E. -E. That's how you pronounce it. But it's literally spelled Z-O-E. So zoe refers to both physical and spiritual life. John took the advantage of both usages in the, in the words throughout the gospel. The theme of eternal life is one of the most important themes that John talks about in this passage, paralleling the significance of the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke on the theme of the kingdom of God or of heaven. The term life occurs twice in this verse and more than 40 times throughout the gospels. The readers are alerted to keep both physical and spiritual uh, usages of the term life in mind when you're reading the Gospel of John. And so when John wrote chapter 1, verse 4, that life was in Jesus, that meant not just physical life, that is, that we're held in existence, we were created by Him, and He holds us into existence, but also it was referring to our spiritual part of us, and that the only way that we can have life, spiritual life, is in Christ Jesus. So it's important to be reminded of that. When you look at verse 5, the term light, it, appearing, it appears first in the previous verse, and it's used again here, refers to Jesus himself. Like life, light is an important theme in John's gospel. Jesus identified himself as the light of the world, chapter 8 and verse 12. The light stands in contrast to darkness. <clears throat> representing darkness, representing evil, and um, so Jesus is the antithesis of darkness. He is light. And John later pointed out that when Judas went to portray Jesus, it was at night, talking about under the cover of darkness. And you know, folks, it never ceases to amaze me that many, uh, many times uh, sin is done in dark places. It's done under the cover of darkness, thinking, you know, a lot of times, now not always, but a lot of times people break into houses they thief, they steal. It is sometimes at nighttime. And I guess it's because it's under the cover of darkness. People think, oh, nobody can see me and, you know, I can get away with this. But the truth is, 
in our country and around the world today, it doesn't matter what people get away with. They may get away with some things, but not with God, because God sees it all. And it doesn't matter whether you're stealing something or whether you're committing immorality or whatever you want to put in there, God sees everything. Everything is open to Him. Everything is, is lit up, if you will, to Him. He sees everything. So it doesn't matter whether it's under the cover of darkness or it's broad daylight, God sees all. And, um, you know, there, there are several attributes of God that, that I love to talk about. And one of them, obviously, is God's omnipotence because He's all powerful, he, he can do anything. But also because He is omniscient. And that means he knows. It comes from the word omni, which means all, and then um, omniscient. The last part of that, obviously, science, knowledge. So you put them together, God is all-knowing. And, um, you know, Jonah thought he could get away with some things in his life, right? God told him to go to Nineveh and preach to the people in Nineveh, uh, that that God was going to destroy them if they didn't change their ways. And Jonah decided because they're his enemy, he's going to run from them. And you can't run from God. I mean, you just can't. God knew where Jonah was, and God repositioned him to where he would agree to go back and do what God told him to do in the first place. And, uh, and so God sees everything. God knows where we're at. There's nothing hidden with him. I have a question about that, though. Yes, ma'am. Jonah chose not to, and God gives us free will. Yes, so why did, why did God still make him do it? God didn't make him do it. Uh, God still gave him a choice. But you stay in that way on that's what I was going to say. I mean, hey, you, you go your own way or not, but I mean, God's going to put you into places many times that will kind of make you think, hey, I may need to do what God told me to do. I mean, obviously, we've still got a free will. We can still choose and not do it. But I'll tell you what. Uh, I believe I'd have, well, I don't, I don't know that I would have, have ran from God to begin with as far as God telling me to, listen, if God told me to do something you today, a lot of soul searching in that way about that, that's it. That's right. <laughs> a lot of soul searching. So, um, you know, Hey, let me think about this. All right. Do I let God spit me out of the well so I can go do what he told me to do in the first place? Or am I going to die right here? I mean, that's basically what his options were. So, but he still had that free will. He could have said, Nope, man, I, I don't want to do this God. And I'm not going to do it. I, I'll, you know, go ahead and take care of it, you know, but anyway, um, but he still had the free will to do that or not to do that. So, all right. Come up out of the spout. <laughs> <laughs> that had been a pretty big spout. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by the way, the Bible never says it's, it's a whale. No. It, it says a great fish. People just assume that it's a whale, but I'm going to tell you folks, if you go down to Cheatham Dam, Brother Stanley knows what I'm talking about. He's, he's camped down there years ago. Uh, somebody ran a car off close to Cheatham Dam, and they had divers go off in there, and uh, they came up with eyes this big and said, we're not going back down there. There's catfish bigger than we are. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it could be any kind of fish. Every lake and every dam, yep. the same story. Right. So, anyway, so, I mean, you know, God can create any kind of fish he wants to create. I mean, and there are fish that are, I'm sure, are that big or bigger that could probably swallow somebody. Um, but anyway or at least were back then. Um, So, all right. Uh, When you look in chapter 1, verses 9 through 14, John kind of interrupts something here. He interrupts his presentation of Jesus to introduce somebody. And it's very interesting, uh, this man, John the Baptist, kind of of a wild guy, if you will. Uh, I think about, you know kind of like a Rambo or something, I guess, if, you know, living on the land and eating, you know, all these things that we probably would not even try to eat. Uh, But anyway, John the Baptist is, uh, he comes on the scene, uh, John introduces him, and when you look, all in the New Testament Gospels uh, introduce Jesus' ministry with a a reference to the work and ministry of John the Baptist. Uh, By referring to John the Baptist as a man sent from God, uh, the, the writer sought to show him due respect and clarify his role as a witness to Jesus, the light. John did not come as the light. He came to bear witness of the light. And so when you look in verse 9, we find that Jesus is the true light. John used the word true throughout his gospel, basing its meaning on the Hebrew concept of faithfulness and dependability. As such, Jesus is also the true vine, chapter 15 and verse 1, if you would, you turn and look there at some point. 
and his father is the true God. That's in chapter 17 and verse 3. But John referred to the incarnation, that is, Jesus becoming flesh, by saying the true light was coming into the world. And then we get this from the Greek word cosmos, or as in cosmetology, the study of the universe, uh, the created universe. Here, John used the term world to refer to the home of humans over against God's home above. And later, at later places in the gospel, John used the term world to refer to sinful people who reject Jesus. So what was the purpose of the true light of Jesus Christ coming uh, into the realm of the, God, of, of the people? The true light, Jesus, was to provide light to everyone, chapter 1, verse 4. And in the context that it's written in, it literally is to give light referring to spiritual enlightenment. That is, Jesus came not necessarily to give physical light, although he is the one that created light, but he came to light up our lives spiritually. That is, to show us what truth is, to show us the only way to a relationship with God the Father, and it is through him. And you know in John chapter 14, Jesus himself says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He came to give us spiritual awakening, spiritual light, if you will. And that was the reason that he came. Uh, he came to bring light into a dark, spiritually dark world. Uh, all right, I'm going to try to fast forward a little bit. Verse 10. The term world appears three times in this verse, and it emphasizes the realm and where people lived, and emphasized those people as the object of God's love and of Christ's purpose and mission in this life. Jesus came into the very world he created, and he came to bring into that world light. This transcendent God walked around as a person who could be heard, seen, touched, but the world, that is, people that Jesus created, did not even recognize him as who he was. And at this point, John literally states the fact that human failure to grasp the significance of Jesus coming into the world, some people fail to recognize uh, him because of their preconceived notions about the Messiah. They thought Jesus was coming into the world to create an earthly kingdom. But that wasn't his purpose. He came to create a spiritual kingdom. That is, to, to, to come into the world, to bring spiritual light into the world, so that everyone here could know who Jesus was and who God was through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, um, verse 11 talks about the fact that, that the world rejected him. His, his own, he came to his own and his own received him not. And so um, the world rejected who he was as a general rule. But I'm thankful that there were some that did receive him because we would not have the gospel today were it not for those who trusted Christ by faith and who began to spread the gospel throughout the world. And uh, so I am so grateful to those who did believe him and who did trust in him. And you know what? I know a lot of times Christians feel like that they're on their own. It's like, man, there's nobody around taking a stand for Christ like I am. And I've actually heard people mention things like that. But folks, I am glad that we've got brothers and sisters all around the world that are spreading the light of Jesus Christ. And we're supposed to do that. And by the way, in other countries, in some other countries, particularly in the Middle East and other countries like that, man, they are spreading the gospel even under immense persecution. I mean, and they don't mind people knowing, even though they know they're going to face death for their faith, they're still getting the gospel out there. And oftentimes, those are the places where Christianity is being spread more than it is here, even under the persecution. And it's because people are seeing, hey, these people are willing to die for their faith. You know, and that's the thing. People over there are willing to die for their faith. We're not willing to live for ours. I mean, it really is. If we know Jesus and we believe this Bible to be true, then man, we're, not, we're doing everyone a disjustice by not saying, here's what faith is about. Here's what eternal life has to do with. It has to do with Jesus Christ. You know, there are religious groups all around the world that are not ashamed to talk about their faith. And yet, look at us. We sit back. And we let the world literally, and I, and I don't mean disrespect or not trying to be funny or literally going to hell in a handbasket, if you will. Um, we don't care about people. If we did, we would tell them about Jesus. And we would tell them about the forgiveness of sin 
that we have in Him. So it's important that we share the light of Jesus Christ with those who have yet to hear. And by the way, you don't have to go very far to find people that hadn't heard about Jesus. You, it, you, it blew my mind one time, and this was 20-something years ago. Uh, well, it had been longer than that. How old am I? I'm 43, fixing to be 44. So I was a teenager. I'm not even going to try to do the math there. But I was about 15 years old, so whatever that is. Um, I was going door to door, uh, handing out tracts, gospel tracts, uh, with a couple other teenagers from my church. And we were just going, I think we covered, I want to say that one day we covered about 60 homes, just passing out tracts that day. And I knocked on the door, and this person came to the door, and uh, this was an older person. This wasn't a young person. And I said, hey, uh, you know, not trying to pressure you in anything, just want to give you a track. And, you know, would you please do me a favor and read this track? It tells you about who God is and who Jesus is. And I'll never forget the man, when he looked at me, he said, he said, well, I know who God is, but who's Jesus? And I mean, it blew my mind. This is in the, God, this, the Bible Belt. This person had never heard about Jesus. And we take it for granted, folks, that everybody around here knows who Jesus is. It's just not true. Not everybody knows. So we've got to get the gospel out there. And there are people that are going to listen, and they're going to respond to the word. And there are people that are going to say, oh, that's not for me. And they're going to go their own way. But the truth is, at least you have said, hey, I'm following the command that God's given me, and I'm putting the gospel out there. It's their responsibility to, to respond to it. We just simply have to obey God and, and put the message out there. All right. Uh, when you look, oh, man, I got this upside down. How did I do that? And, folks, I am not going to get through with the lesson today. Be what? It's not hard to turn it around, I guess. I must have put it in backwards. But anyway, when you look in verse 13, um, this verse makes it clear that salvation is of God alone. It's not the result of biological action being born as a child of Christian parents. Okay, We cannot be born physically um, alive spiritually, if you will. We have to be born of the Spirit. We have to be have a relationship with Jesus Christ in order to be spiritually alive. We're physically alive, although physic or spiritually dead. And so we need Jesus Christ to make us spiritually alive. Being born as a, as a child of a Christian parent does not automatically make a child a believer, nor is salvation a matter of fulfilling natural human desires. Finally, salvation is, is not a matter of the human will. By eliminating every human avenue for obtaining salvation or, or spiritual birth, John turned the focus on God as a single source of new life. Yet how can sinful people find God since they're separated from Him by their sin? John answered the question, um, and I've got to, I'm just going to tear this out because I've got to flip it around. John answered the question in the next verse by talking about how the eternal Word who was with God and was God came to live in a world of sinful man. And then when you look in verse 14, John introduced the concept of the Word, which was mentioned in, in chapter 1, verse 1. The divine Word took on flesh in reference to uh, no referencing to sinful nature, but rather the simple sense that Jesus is becoming a human being. The Bible says that Jesus was just like we are, but there was one difference, yet without sin. That's how Jesus was able to be our Redeemer. Because even though He lived like you and I live, He never one time sinned. Not once. And so that is how Jesus was able to be our kinsman redeemer, if you will. He took on flesh. He dwelt among us. Uh, John wrote the, um, that people observed his glory, referring to the honor that God revealed in Jesus. And um, he was unique in the fact that he was full of grace and truth. And so, folks, Jesus came so that not just we could have life but that the whole world could. And somehow, some way, we have got to understand the importance that we are getting the gospel of Jesus out there. You know, God has placed you and He's placed me in unique opportunities. We're around people all the time. You're around people that I am not ever around. 
And what happens if one of us drops the ball and said, oh, well, I'm going to count on my preacher or I'm going to count on this person in the church to witness this person that we never are going to see. It is our responsibility, the people that God has placed in our path, that we are to be light. And see, if every believer would be a light like they're supposed to be, would be a witness, man, think about how many people could be exposed to the gospel. I'm not saying they're going to accept it, but our job isn't to make somebody become a believer in Jesus. We simply put the gospel message out there, and then the Holy Spirit of God takes over and begins to convict. You see, some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. And we've got to be reminded of that. Because I'll tell you, sometimes it gets disheartening. When we talk about the light of Jesus to others, and they don't want to hear, and we're thinking, man, I must not have done a good enough job. You know, listen, that's not our responsibility. We are to get the truth out there, speak the truth in love. The Spirit of God takes over and does His job. And it's their responsibility to either respond or to say, no, I'm not going to respond to it. I'm going to reject it. But folks, I'll tell you, if we love people, and I do, I mean, I love everybody, if we love people, then we're going to tell them, you need Christ. You need Jesus. And so, um, oh, that's Tim coming in. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close this morning. Uh, I've got some folks that are they're supposed to be here any minute. I wanted to try to try to get as much of a lesson in as possible. Uh, Randall's going to be coming in just a minute. I think he's got some stuff we need to set up for him. So, um, all right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. All right. We're going to pray. Jimmy, would you mind dismissing us in prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for the freedom to come to your house. And- we give praise and honor and glory to you and it's because of our brave men and women mm. in the service that have helped give us that freedom but because of you giving us all life yes. we have that opportunity to do everything that we can to spread your word we just ask for that courage and knowledge to do that and take this message and apply it to our lives Pray to those that don't know you and help them see that you are the only way to heaven is through you and our, our Lord and our Savior. Mm-hmm. We ask that you be with those that are on our prayer list, Lord, or those that will be added to our prayer list during our serve, uh, worship service. You are a great physician mm-hmm. and you know our every need. And we ask all this in your heaven. Amen. Amen.